This lecture considers forced harmonic motion. This is a good subject where we can see the effects of damping. I would break the general area into single degree of freedom studies and multiple degree of freedom studies. It's best to start with a single degree of freedom or at least to concentrate on a single uh, component of motion such that you develop the time dependence of the various forces involved. Then when you go to multiple degree of freedom systems, you have to think about the spatial way that these forces are distributed over the body. By this time, we have a pretty good idea of spring-like forces and inertia forces, but we haven't really looked at damping forces yet, and that is a rather rich area of technology. There are whole symposia de devoted just to that topic of how do we set the damping coefficients, how do we measure them, and so forth. I'll use a phasor diagram concept, which comes from electrical engineering, to discuss the relationship both between the forces and the displacements in a um, oscillating mechanical system. Then we looked at forced harmonic motion. You can think of that as forced at a natural frequency or away from a natural frequency of the system. We look at damping in both the single degree of freedom and the multiple degree of freedom systems and then finish We'll look at the phasor diagram first of all. This is a convenient vector way of looking at rotating vectors to represent a harmonic time dependence. The original physical body might be this potato-shaped body, which has these discrete forces acting on it at the nodes. The force field could de be defined then as this vector quantity F tilde, which could be a complex vector, times the e to the i omega t. Capital omega is meant to be an arbitrary frequency, not necessarily the natural frequency of the system. We can take a temporary notation here for breaking the F, capital F tilde into its magnitude and the phase angle, and that phase angle could vary from degree of freedom to degree of freedom in the system. So I've included several such phase angles. This common time dependence can be factored out. And if you now consider this as a set of complex vectors, and if we concentrate on just one of them, let's say there's a degree of freedom 7, which is horizontal at this node, for instance, u7. Then the question is, uh, what are the forces on that degree of freedom? And there would be an amplitude a7 with some phase angle psi 7. This is shown with respect to um, a horizontal axis uh, as a leading phase. It might also be lagging, so we have to keep that in mind. We've defined our force field and shown a complex vector which can be broken into magnitude and phase angles. Let's do the same thing for the resulting displacement field. U tilde will be our displacements, complex displacements at the nodal degrees of freedom. I'll again use a temporary notation here of a letter B with subscript N representing the specific response magnitude at a specific degree of freedom, and then a phase angle CN. If we pick that same degree of freedom 7, we would show this blue vector as the magnitude and then this C7 as the phase lead again. Normally, the force will be leading the response in a system, especially if there's only one force and one response involved. Later in a multiple degree of freedom system, this is not um, obvious and, and in fact doesn't happen in as much as you can have a number of forces at different phase angles and a number of responses at different phase angles.
Now let's look at the physics involved in a forced linear elastic system with damping. We're going to have the force vector acting on this multiple degree of freedom system, and we're going to have a response that depends on the relative magnitudes of the masses damping and the stiffnesses in the system. A general equation of motion is shown here. This could have been derived by other methods than finite elements, and often is. Many times it's derived by um, other uh, numerical methods such as uh, finite differences or by boundary element methods or other Rayleigh-Ritz approaches. Here I show a mass matrix capital M, the nodal displacements with the acceleration as shown as two dots. Here's the damping matrix B and the nodal velocities the stiffness matrix K and the nodal displacements. On the right side, we have the live loads F. And often in civil engineering, particularly, the constraint forces are um, taken as a separate vector here. But in mechanical engineering and aerospace and, and a number of others, we absorb that Q into the live loads and don't draw a distinction between live and reaction forces. The symbol N is for any possible nonlinear forces. Sometimes those are externally applied. Sometimes these nonlinear effects are, in fact, internally elastic nonlinearities that are um, posed as if they were external and might be compensating for nonlinear material properties. So in general, this could be uh, due to a wide variety of causes. We're going to neglect that in our studies today. So below I show this, neglect the nonlinear forces, absorb the reactions into the live load vector. We find in this next figure that when the external force field is harmonic, that this allows you to do simple solutions in algebraic form. And the complex arithmetic is a big help. Here's our equation in the simplified form, as we had discussed in the previous figure. We're using a force vector with harmonic time dependence and a uh, response displacement with a harmonic time dependence. We insert those proposed solutions here into the ordinary set of differential equations so that the response appears in this side. This is related to the method of undetermined coefficients where a person in a ordinary differential equation is able to guess the answer here pretty much based on the form of the forcing function over here. That's a legitimate process and, and very powerful, especially in these linear systems where a knowledge of the input to the problem often is useful in guessing the uh, information about the output. We cancel the common time dependence on both sides, all of the E, I, omega t's. And collecting the coefficients in the large parentheses, we get this relation. The derivatives have caused the minus omega squared and the I omega term to pop out as a pair of algebraic modifiers. We think of this whole quantity as a complex mechanical impedance and give it the symbol Z. Z depends on this frequency, capital Omega. Capital Omega is a measure of the frequency of the load, not of the frequency of the internal response. In this case, we will find, however, that the two are linked together because it's a linear system and a particularly nice forcing function. Were this a nonlinear system, we would have found that this cap omega
originally associated with the force on the right uh, might cause several different kinds of frequencies in the interior of the system. In that case, those are called superharmonics and subharmonics. It's really only in a nice linear system like this that we have the luxury of imposing a frequency on the right side and seeing it with perfect clarity reproduced in the response on the left side. If we use that symbol Z as a complex impedance, our equation simplifies greatly as shown below. This equation is commonly used in structures all around the world. Everyone knows it and loves it. Other fields where there are oscillatory processes would have similar equations. Acoustics, let's say, or electromagnetics. Now we need to sweep out the frequency response curve by evaluating this response at each of a number of discrete frequencies. The formal expression is given here, but we know that actually that's done by triangular factorization of the impedance matrix. This is similar to a static solution by a direct solver. So the user will pick a set of frequencies that are sufficient to map out a response curve. These are often done in terms of the frequency in hertz rather than uh, the circular frequency omega. You solve that problem, say m times, and plot some measure of the amplitude response as in this upper curve. Here I'm showing an absolute value. You should do that so that the phase sense is carried by the phase angle. So this is basically a polar concept in complex arithmetic. That way you don't get a abrupt change in the location of this um, uh, hill here because of a, a sign change. Below I have also plotted the complex impedance uh, in the absolute value and we see that of course when the impedance is a minimum that's where the response is a maximum. At this minimum you find the inertia and damping terms are canceling out some of the inherent static stiffness. So the mechanical system is not as stiff at some of these higher frequencies as it is at zero frequency. And of course that's what leads to the resonance shown above. The frequency response approach that we are discussing here is very important in several technical fields. Airplanes, ships, automobiles, these all have a power source that's a reciprocating engine or at least a rotating piece of machinery that is located at a specific point in that structure. The frequencies can change in time, and that's why you need to map out the whole frequency response curve to understand your system. Those problems are a little different than that, say, in the missile industry where you have a rocket engine. And if you've heard of the crackling noise of a, of a rocket out in cold air, you know that there are many frequencies involved there. Other systems for which this might not be appropriate could perhaps be something like a bridge where you had a moving load, uh, cars that are moving in space, rather than a um, harmonic force applied at one specific point. So for those technical fields where this concept is relevant, it really is simple and it's useful under these kinds of cases, uh, automotive, aircraft, it shows the character of the system because if you put on a constant force magnitude over a range of frequencies, then you pick up the resonant points. These, of course, are close to the um, natural frequency.
Let's focus our attention now on damping. Damping is very important in the structure. It governs the amplitude at resonance. In other words, the real damage that's done if your system is subjected to a frequency uh, that corresponds to an internal frequency. So in other words, if the driving force happens to coincide with a frequency at which the structure wants to vibrate, then you can have trouble. One classic case was an automobile made in Detroit where the right passenger seat in the front had a resonance at the same frequency as the idling frequency of the engine. That meant that when a person pulled up to a stoplight and idled, the right front seat started to shake uh, in a resonant mode and uh, with large amplitude. I have a friend who had a car like that and found that it was very disturbing because it moved some six or eight inches uh, flopping around. Damping is due to a number of physical mechanisms. Uh, your initial thought might be that it would be internal to the material, but actually most of the damping occurs at joints where there is looseness and friction uh, in that joint. There are um, some forms of damping at cut edges, particularly acoustic radiation can, can damp down a very thin structure. Then if you have internal uh, flu uh, uh, fuel tanks, you can get damping, or if your system is a submarine and working with an external fluid around it, of course, that also has a uh, large damping effect. There's not much doubt about the time dependence part of damping forces. They tend to oppose motion. They tend to directly oppose the uh, velocity of the system. That's true for the uh, viscous and uh, structural damping and uh, coulomb damping as well. Now you have to you have to say a little more about that. How does it directly oppose the motion? And for the harmonic system, uh, that will allow us to say more in terms of phasor diagrams. When you have multiple degree of freedom systems, the spatial distribution that you get is a little more trouble because some kinds of physical damping are distributed throughout the structure according to where the mass is. Other damping types are distributed more where the stiffness distribution. And then those that are due to external um, fluid forces on surfaces might have to do a surface area, so-called wetted area, and, and so on. Now, there's some simplifications made on this. Rayleigh was able to make such a simplification years ago, and that's one way to help out in this particularly um, troublesome area, considering the spatial distribution of damping forces. We're going to study damping first by looking at a single degree of freedom system. If we cause that single degree of freedom system to move in a harmonic displacement, then we can relate the force to that displacement through phasor diagrams. This is an obvious thing to do with a linear single degree of freedom system, and that works nicely for structural damping and viscous damping. We're also going to cycle a nonlinear system through harmonic motion without saying how we could do that. Uh, merely imposing a constraint on the uh, displacement field to make it harmonic in time. So that's the common thread through what we're going to do here is a harmonically moving system. Now we're going to do this by impressing a harmonic load on the um, linear systems and then get this harmonic displacement as a result. The phasor diagram on the left here is the kinematic quantities, displacement, velocity, acceleration. Note that these are 90 degree changes here from one to the other. Mathematically, you can get that by multiplying uh, by the imaginary number i. In the phasor concept, these three are presumed to be rotating counterclockwise with the frequency of both the applied force and the response. 
I've also put on this figure the dashed line showing the external force and with the suggestion here that it leads the response, which would be typical of a single degree of freedom system. In fact, that external force could either be nearly in phase or nearly 180 degrees leading. So that's the range over which the external force can lead the response in a single degree of freedom system. Now the forces are described by a second phasor diagram on the right, and the external force will be balanced by inertial, elastic, and damping forces. And these directions are pretty well fixed then in terms of, uh, especially for viscous and um, uh, structural damping, in that the damping force is going to directly oppose, in sense, the velocity over here in the first phasor diagram. Uh, then the elastic forces are, are known to oppose the elastic deformations U. The inertia forces um, through F equals MA are known to oppose the acceleration uh, vector over here. So um, the main argument seems to be for, at least for linear systems, is how long is this vector here? I'm going to use the classic symbols up on the uh, figure to the uh, right here of a spring K with a, this jagged uh, lightning-like uh, uh, character. And then a cloud here, not knowing yet what kind of damping we're going to put on. And then a uh, mass here, which is presumed to be up at a point. So it's a concentrated mass. The force is applied to the mass downward, and the uh, displacement that results is also downward. So these are uh, of the same sign convention. Let's study viscous damping in more detail now. Viscous damping has historically been the chief academic learning tool for damping. And it has many practical applications, particularly if there are uh, fluids involved in the, in the system. I would say it's being overshadowed today by structural damping, which is the one that's more commonly used in build-up structures. But let's look at viscous damping very carefully. The force that you get when you move a body that has viscous damping on it is um, a negative force opposing the velocity. And then there's a coefficient of proportionality, and we'll use this lowercase b here. In the figure on the right, I'm showing that damping force opposing the velocity, and I'm presuming that the body is, is uh, moving downward, that it has positive displacement down, positive velocity, and positive acceleration. That's a common way that one would draw such a free body diagram as I have on the right. Free body diagram. Um, this kind of damping is literally true if you take a can full of oil and then maybe take the lid off and, and weld it to a rod and then oscillate the rod up and down in a full can of oil. We did this back at the master's level and it works out beautifully. You really get viscous damping from that. So something paddle shaped that's moving in fluid is definitely going to have some viscous effects. And because of that, engineers have used universally this dash pot symbol to indicate that there's a viscous damper in play. And of course, you're already familiar with the uh, spring-like uh, figure for an elastic force system. Now, the inertia we show is a, is a vector uh, opposing the acceleration upward. So basically, you get the sign sense from this free body diagram and the differential equation shown on the left. Um, in fact, what you're really doing is connecting two points, which either of which might move by a viscous damper, and that you really probably need to show the damper as a uh, force dependent on the relative motion of these two velocities, and then accounting for a proper sign here. Um, 
this is a way that we Now for this linear system, I'm going to impose a harmonic external force and then the system will oscillate in a harmonic way. Here we have the force, here we have the displacement, and then we can calculate the viscous force shown here. There are several important things to notice. One is the, quote, you might say direction of the force, uh, which would be in the phasor diagram for forces straight down. Um, but the important thing I'm trying to point in, in this figure is that you have a proportionality to omega and that the viscous force itself changes as frequency changes. Now, if you follow the motion of the system then and you put a sensor on the system that reads displacement and you put this on a cathode ray tube, you would find your harmonic motion would tend to move this point of light back and forth like, forth like this. Now if we put a second transducer on that measures the viscous force shown on the vertical axis, this figure will open up into a so-called Lissajou figure. And this time you'll find that when there is positive motion, in other words going this way, that your viscous force is going to be negative uh, in, in the single direction we're thinking of will be down below and uh, have a negative value. So actually you progress around a circle in the Lissajou figure in this way. The area enclosed therein would be related to the work done during one cycle of motion. It would be force through a distance. The interesting thing in viscous damping is if you do this faster, then the Lissajou figure opens up because the force gets higher. So that the area under a curve like this grows and you do more damping per cycle of closed motion through one cycle of motion. But it's more serious than that because you're doing more cycles per second as you go at a faster frequency. And so viscous damping is very effective at making motion subside at high frequencies. And you could understand that if you threw a vibrating ping pong ball into a barrel of molasses. You wouldn't expect it to vibrate very long. So um, viscous damping has a double whammy on Let's now look at structural damping. Uh, structural damping is being widely used today in the study of response of built-up structures. We define it in the context of harmonic motion. Once you go to non-harmonic motion, it's a little harder to discuss it, and it's really not as appropriate, although it's used as an approximation in multi-degree of freedom systems. There's no uh, problem in figuring out the sense of the uh, damping force when you have structural damping because it opposes the, the velocity. And so on this uh, phasor diagram below, this is the vector pointing straight down. The interesting thing is that it's been found by experiment many years ago at MIT by uh, Ted Pian and others that the magnitude of this vector here is proportionate to the size of the structural force over here. And that's been confirmed in tests where the uh, correlation is excellent. Uh, the eye carries the uh, phase relation here so as to show that this vector, in fact, leads by 90 degrees this vector. And then there's a proportionality coefficient g here that's universally used for structural damping. If you look at that formula that we just wrote down for structural damping force, you find that there is no frequency uh, explicitly called out there. This force goes um, uh, with magnitude uh, GKU. Uh, of course, you need the phase relation to properly orient it with respect to the uh, 
this uh, time base here. But there is no omega appearing in that, no, no driving force. So in this case, as you form a Lissajous figure on an oscilloscope, you find that you trace out this ellipse here. And the faster you go, um, nothing happens. <laughs> you get the same area. So the amount of energy that is absorbed per unit cycle remains the same. However, structural damping will also tend to uh, dissipate higher frequency oscillations because there will be more of those cycles per unit time. So uh, structural damping does work on higher frequencies, but uh, really not as effectively as viscous damping can. And the uh, physical nature of this is due to uh, joints, uh, material damping, anything where you have a rubbing process in the structure. The cleanest structure that I ever saw was a all-welded power pole for Detroit Edison. And as I'm remembering, the structural damping was 002. Now, roughly speaking, that means that when you resonate that, you get 500 times the uh, effect of a static force of the same magnitude. Um, automotive structures tend to have G's closer to uh, 0.05. And that was the number that Bendix Aerospace System used on a, um, uh, a payload on a missile, on a Minuteman missile that was made up of a lot of, uh, lot of uh, riveted joints. So I think if you don't know what to do, you have to guess uh, structural damping coefficient somewhere between maybe 0.02 and 0.05, depending on how many joints are in the structure. And I wouldn't use something like this 0 .002 that was an entirely all-welded structure and very, very tightly tuned that way, so badly so that the wind resonated it and it dropped off its cross arms. Our fourth type of damping is called Coulomb damping. This really causes a nonlinear response, and so uh, I'm going to enforce harmonic motion when it comes time to discuss a Lissajous figure that you might create through experiment. It opposes velocity and has a magnitude that does not depend on the kinematics of the motion except for the sign of the velocity. And so uh, Coulomb friction has a constant of proportionality C here that depends typically on clamping friction between two surfaces and then the minus the sign of the velocity. So whatever sign the velocity has then this force is going to oppose it on this simple system here. The force when done in a very slow manner will change with velocity in this way. Some of you may also know that depending which way you go, if this system's at rest in, in, or moving in one direction, let's, let's suppose you've brought it to rest. That's probably the best way to look at it. Then if I try to go with a negative velocity, sometimes you'll get an overshoot, uh, which is called sometimes a static coefficient of friction, which might be some 30% you know, higher than this, uh, this dynamic coefficient of friction that we're discussing. Likewise, if you tried to move from a still uh, rest point and then accelerate to the right, um, by the time it broke free, it would have given an overshoot there as well. Now, Coulomb damping doesn't depend on frequency, so that makes it similar to the structural damping. Uh, and there are static values involved when the thing is clamped just prior to breaking free. Uh, this rather abrupt change uh, that is shown here is characteristic of nonlinear systems, though, because you don't get small changes ca calling sm causing small effects. You get small changes, such as a velocity change, causing very large effects. Let's do look at the Lissajous figure that you would get in the same experiment that we've discussed earlier, where you measure displacement on the horizontal axis and frictional force on the vertical. This is our Coulomb force here. 
as you start out um, moving to the right, there's no change as you increase uh, displacement uh, through a normal harmonic cycle. And then when you uh, come to rest at the extreme part of this cycle, remember we're moving harmonically on this horizontal axis now. So you come to rest when you hit to the right edge here. So this will stop and, and will drop to zero, but then will build up as you reverse and possibly overshoot a little bit. So there might be a little ear there. Then you'll travel back along this side, back down, possibly overshoot a little before you uh, reach that point. But the area under here is not dependent on frequency, and uh, you get a square area this time. Um, I guess some people might say, well, then it would be a little more effective than structural damping. Yes, but not a lot. Um, and I think the two are somewhat related physically because they both have to do with friction in joints primarily uh, and, and, and can have other sources too. It's useful to be able to compare the viscous damping coefficient and the structural damping coefficient at any driven frequency, capital omega. We'll do this by taking the viscous equation of equilibrium here, where the damping is proportionate to velocity. When you put in the harmonic time dependence, you pop out an I omega term on the damping and a minus omega squared on the inertia terms. The structural problem is inherently defined here as a harmonic situation, although I've written a general equation here, which is a little shaky because it's really only true for harmonic motion. But in this harmonic version, which is uh, appropriate, now the damping appears on the displacement term, but with a phase lead I. And the, again, the inertia term has a minus uh, omega squared behavior. In order for these two types of damping to give the same damping effect at a given frequency, capital omega, we can equate those coefficients then uh, that appear. The K I G U here has to be the same as the I omega B U up here. Since u is the same in both cases, we cancel it and we get this parametric relation. And when you treat g as the known and solve in this direction for equivalent viscous damping, then you have this general relation. And this is valid at all driven frequencies omega. Later, we will make some comparisons between viscous damping and structural damping that are only true near a resonant point, and so you must be careful on that distinction. When comparing structural damping coefficient to a viscous damping coefficient at a specific frequency, the user must be careful because that relation cannot hold over a wide frequency range uh, literally. The reason is, in this figure shown below, that if I follow through to the force that's created by each of those kinds of damping, and if you do make an e um, equivalent viscous damping to structural at some given frequency, say this particular value here of omega 4, then the relation is perfectly true at that frequency. But as you move away from that frequency using those same numbers for viscous and structural damping, you'll find that the viscous damping creates higher forces than the structural. And conversely, at, at lower frequencies, that structural damping is more effective than the viscous. So you have to be a bit careful in how you go from a given structural damping to a viscous damping. Indeed, many real structures might have some law that varies somewhere in between these two. If you thought the system had some fluids in it, the sloshing of fuel, and some elastomers, and so on. And uh, to help bridge this gap and make more of a uh, frequency-dependent and frequency-accurate relation, uh, codes such as NASTRAN allow structural damping to be put in as a function of frequency. Um, that's a sort of a paradoxical 
approach in a sense, but you're correcting for some real world effects when you do that. And uh, in some of our examples in this class, we will be showing G as a function of frequency. Now, the classical structural damping is constant with respect to frequency, but the real world says that it can uh, vary because there are other um, complications in the problem, such as some, some partial viscous effects. It's interesting to compare the numerical values of viscous damping coefficients with structural damping coefficients. And as we've just seen, you really need to do that at a specific frequency so that you know what you're doing. There's another um, interesting comparison, and that is when you are in the vicinity of resonance of a mechanical system. And this is often best discussed in terms of the damping ratio uh, where you take the, say, the viscous damping ratio where you take the coefficient B over a critical value, B critical. Now, this critical value of viscous damping, you can look up in elementary textbooks, it's the one that leads to uh, time histories on meters, say a voltage meter, and where you'll find that given a um, disturbance in, in voltage that the system will only perhaps have one zero crossing, which means that you've damped out the um, violent fluctuations of the meter. So this is a rather important concept in uh, single degree of freedom damped systems. Now, if we compare viscous and structural damping coefficients near a resonance, what we mean is the frequency capital omega is going to be driven toward square root of k over m. So we're going to shake this system closer and closer to its natural frequency. We, we can redefine this damping ratio now by putting the viscous damper in terms of its structural equivalent. So this is where we've done equivalent viscous damping. Below here, you have the uh, critical damping ratio on a viscous system. And you find a lot of cancellation as you set the uh, frequency equal to the natural frequency as given here, square root of k over m. Till finally, you find that the viscous damping ratio is the structural coefficient over 2, often written with the 2 upstairs. And so that a structural damping factor of 0.05 would mean you had uh, 0.025 in terms of viscous damping ratio. So many people remember this, but that's really true at a natural frequency, right in the neighborhood of a frequency, one of the natural frequencies. And I give a problem on this, I think it's problem one in our homework work that we'll go through, just to show that if you pick some other frequency, this relation does not hold. Matter of fact, it's off by, I don't know, a factor of 20 or something like that. So. Uh, so you do have to be careful about what you mean by um, replacing one coefficient with the other. While we've been comparing these coefficients near resonance, let's go a little farther and see what the amplitude of response is. For the viscous damping case, you get this curve. Uh, on the horizontal axis, you have the excitation frequency, and on the vertical axis you have a non-dimensional displacement. This is the ratio of the response that you get in the given problem compared to a response you would have gotten with a static solution, which merely is the magnitude of the force over the stiffness. Static solutions are governed entirely by the uh, stiffness of the system. So this is a ratio that you get. Uh, often called a magnification ratio. The peak value is given here in terms of the damping coefficient. And that, for low damping coefficients, is approximated by 1 over 2 zeta. Likewise, for structural damping in a similar non-dimensional way over here, uh, and then again with frequency on the horizontal axis, the peak is 1 over um, g. And this directly then becomes a magnification ratio. So for instance, for the conventional value of g equal 
to 0 0.5, you would have, oh, I'm sorry, and that's 0 0.05, uh, you would have a magnification, 1 over g, of 20. So that a dynamic load of that magnitude oscillating the structure at resonance would make it move 20 times as much as a um, equivalent static force would. We've taken quite a bit of time discussing the time history and uh, even frequency dependence of these damping forces. Now let's think about the distribution of these forces over the space or the domain of the problem. Now we're talking about multiple degree of freedom systems. One of the original concepts was proportional damping or Rayleigh damping. Mathematically, the statement is that the damping matrix is a linear combination, part of which is proportionate to the mass distribution of the assembly, and then part of it is proportional to the stiffness distribution. The constants of proportionality here are alpha and beta, which are just numbers. There is some justification for this beta because, indeed, the structural damping forces are proportional to the stiffnesses, so you would expect to find them where the stiffnesses are the greatest. On the other hand, it's less clear how this mass matrix uh, ought to be the spatial distribution representing viscous forces, but uh, which, which are the um, other major type. Uh, and yet that seems to work out well. Perhaps it's because that's where the, the material in the body really is. One could have proposed other things to have added in here, maybe wetted areas or the color of the structure or the smell of the structure. I doubt that those would have gone. But uh, you can see what Rayleigh was getting at here. And we'll see this uh, in a minute, how this gets worked out. When I went to college at Caltech, we all understood this criterion. And we really wished there was a necessary and sufficient condition for uh, keeping a uh, system nicely damped. And Coggy, Tom Coggy at Caltech, came up with such a condition uh, several years after I left. This is the necessary and sufficient condition that the matrix B here lead to so-called uncoupled modes. In other words, this kind of spatial distribution of damping uh, maintains the orthogonality of the modes in the sense that they don't interact, they don't exchange it exchange energy. Um, you get real eigenvalues and eigenvectors in the system. This is a, uh, a wonderful compact criterion. It was repeated by another person in the literature not having uh, seen that this was already done. And so I imagine people are going to rediscover this occasionally as time goes on. Um, it's a bit non-intuitive, but once you have a B matrix, it's pretty good to check to see if it is uh, going to lead to uncoupled modes, because you can just turn the crank and do the multiplication. Well, we've had a lot of physical discussion here about how damping works and how it's distributed. Now, how will we use these damping ideas in actual finite element codes? Well, there are a number of implementations depending on the different codes. You might think, for instance, that you could relate uh, the forces between two individual degrees of freedom, and I've shown that here. That, and in, indeed, you get the uh, familiar 1 minus 1 minus 1 and 1 coefficient multiplied by b in this case. Um, this is useful, and uh, uh, codes often let you do develop damping matrices relating the degrees of freedom. Uh, another way is to create an actual dash pot that connects two nodes so that in two dimensions, which I've shown here on this potato chip, you would get a 4 by 4 matrix with uh, some zeros in it. And then this same dash pot could be connected to nodes in three dimensions.
Another way to introduce viscous damping would you be to use a model where you had elements damped internally and have a real symmetric B matrix that would link together the degrees of freedom within an element. That way you could have changing damping from element to element. Structural damping uh, is also implemented in finite element codes and you might have an overall damping factor shown here on this uh, on this stiffness matrix K. Let's say if that was your overall stiffness matrix, then you would have this G factor multiplying all elastic forces in the system. In MSC Nastran, you can also introduce structural damping element by element so that um, at the element level shown at the bottom here you could have an element G value that multiplies the stiffness of that element itself. You could sum those damping forces into a quantity here K4. Then that part is added here as an afterthought to the dynamic equation the global damping coefficient G could, could either be taken out or uh, still kept in overall and then using only the element damping to make up for exceptional cases. We've been speaking about ways to include damping in a structure in a global sense where we worried about how to distribute damping over the domain or the space that the structure occupies. Another way to look at damping though, and it's probably motivated by experiment, is to think of a system being excited near a resonant mode. Then the exciter can be turned off and you can watch the decay of the uh, vibration and infer something about an equivalent um, viscous damping coefficient. Or think of it as uh, you can do frequency sweeps uh, and there are other ways and then you can ultimately figure out either viscous or structural damping. That's a way of segmenting the structure's motion into these discrete modes of motion. When you have the proper proportional damping, your equations of motion will uncouple into modal equations. The motion then is characterized by generalized coordinates, C sub i here. And I've shown a case here on top which has a um, structural damping coefficient. And then the, the one here has a viscous damping coefficient. In general, then, you could um, infer what the damping for this particular mode is. And so you get different subscripted uh, values for G. G for the first mode, G for the second mode, and so on. It's possible then to close the loop and then um, view G as a function of frequency and then have a lookup table so that when you look at the response of a structure, it goes to that table and uh, you have an interpolation procedure. Now that's a bit of an approximation, if you can see where I'm going here, because the structure won't be moving in pure modes, but will be some combination of modes uh, at any intermediate frequency. So I repeat some of these equivalent forms here for uh, the equivalent viscous damping. Remember that when you use these formula, you really have to be careful whether the uh, quantity omega involved is a lowercase omega, which is a natural frequency, and in particular when there's a subscript such as this, you're speaking about one specific frequency. Or whether, as we did earlier, you can compare uh, motion at a general uh, frequency. Equations, um, you can go back to the original physical set of equations in the coupled form and subject them to 
uh, vibration at any frequency, but these uncoupled ones are only valid at the particular modal frequency involved. Now let's do a few problems, and these will fill out some of the ideas of the lecture. A while ago I mentioned that I was going to do a comparison of viscous and structural damping and compare the coefficients, but not at a resonant frequency. That's a little bit tricky, and uh, you have to be careful on this one. I give a oscillator here with certain spring and a certain mass and a structural damping coefficient. And then I ask, what is the ratio of viscous damping that is equivalent to this at 50 hertz? So now I'm asking you to compare at probably off resonance, because I haven't said that this is the resonant point. And in fact, in the uh, sketch here following, I'm showing that the uh, vibration of this structure is being carried out a well above the uh, first natural frequency omega 1 of the system. So cap omega is 50 hertz. Well, then we've got to be a bit careful. Um, the equivalent um, viscous damping coefficient could be done uh, at the outset at any frequency. And the um, that was the equivalent, and then underneath is the critical value. And so when you take the ratio of these, you get the uh, ratio of viscous damping, uh, which is a, a fraction of critical damping. So we're able to calculate up above the uh, equivalent viscous damping coefficient and down below the critical viscous damping coefficient. When you put numbers in, you get this rather small value then for equivalent viscous damper. Now, why is that? Well, you're so far above the natural frequency. If you remember, the viscous damping gets so effective because of uh, the way that it um, causes higher forces and more, more energy removed because of more cycles per second. And those two add up to have a very powerful effect. So if, if I'm going to take a given structural damping and convert it to equivalent viscous damping, the equivalent viscous damper does not have to be very large in order to um, equate with the structural damper when you're way up here at these frequencies. Well, that's a little bit of a tricky explanation, but we are nowhere near getting the idea that G is going to be 2 times uh, this zeta value. Uh, no way. So um, be careful then when you make those comparisons. Luckily, we don't have to calculate these equivalent viscous damping coefficients very much anymore. I, I think maybe you better think of this as just an uh, academic exercise. It's important for us now to actually nail down this frequency response curve for first a viscously damped uh, linear spring damper system, and then secondly, in the next problem, for structurally damped system. So we start with viscous damping and a single degree of freedom system. And the question is, where is the maximum response that you could call the resonant frequency. Well, by looking at the equation of motion, we find that the complex displacement quantity is related to the complex force by this complex mechanical impedance. And we can take an absolute value of that response and write it in this way. Notice that you've got a square root of a sum of squares of the real and the imaginary parts. Now we'll calculate those zero slope values. We look for the points where the rate of change of response by frequency are zero. And we get this ratio here.
we'll search for zeros by looking for zeros in the numerator rather than infinities in the denominator because uh, that's not of interest. The numerator is a cubic in frequency and we can see by inspection you can factor out one omega constant from all terms. Therefore, omega equals zero is a root and that's the slope condition right here at zero frequency. The remaining quadratic is repeated here and that gives you plus and minus solutions. We're only interested in the positive one and it is shown here. And at this frequency, which we call the resonant frequency. So we've located where the maximum response is in a viscously damp system. We'll simplify that relation for the resonant frequency. Here we factored out a set of terms that we recognize as the natural frequency of the undamped system, but then you have these additional terms which can be represented in terms of the viscous damping ratio. The effect of this correction term here is to lower the resonant frequency and make it slightly less than the natural frequency. And so as the system is more and more highly damped, I'm showing this blue curve here in which its peak is slightly to the left of the natural frequency. I guess I've been calling the natural frequency omega n recently, and this resonant frequency was a capital omega r. So uh, the interesting thing is that viscous damping makes the resonant frequency lower than the natural frequency. That's not obvious. Um, a person would be tempted to make the corollary with the viscous damping slowing the system down, but this is a forced response curve where you're imposing the frequency. So, so it's not really a question of slowing it down, it's just that the peak occurs at a lower frequency, and I think it shows the effectiveness of the viscous damping on attacking uh, higher frequency content. It moves the maximum response to be slightly lower in frequency. Now, to find the peak response, which I'll show by this arrow, uh, we can take the resonant frequency and insert it into the general expression for response, and then that's done here in this bottom uh, line, and then turn the crank and simplify that expression. So we continue the simplification of that um, amplitude ratio and uh, expand these quantities here and we take the absolute values, uh, put in the damping ratio expression and after a lot of algebra you end up with this expression which is a non-dimensional magnification ratio. You could call it a dynamic magnification ratio, uh, the quantity shown by the red arrow here. And that's the exact value at uh, resonance of a viscously damp system. Problem three in our problem set is similar to two, except that it uses structural damping instead of viscous. So now, structural damping. And we'll take the same single degree of freedom spring mass damper, and again ask what is the resonant frequency, um, which is the point of maximum amplitude of vibration. And then we'll compare that with the uh, natural frequency for the system. Now our structural response is shown here, where we use the complex um, mechanical impedance for structural damping involving this IG term. The absolute value here involves the square root of the sum of squares of the reals and imaginaries. We now do the derivative to find those points where the frequency response curve has a zero slope. We get this rather complicated uh, expression for the zero slope condition. 
and again find two places on the frequency axis where the response slope is zero. One of them corresponds to the zero frequency that we're not interested in, and the other is the resonance of this particular body. Now, that resonance point comes out to be the same as the natural frequency when you look at the analytical terms that were found. So in other words, had we had a free vibration case here which went way up to some tremendous peak with zero damping or very little damping, then that lines up almost perfectly, and in, in fact perfectly, with the uh, resonant point that we're getting this time. And if you did a family of curves with structural damping, they would all have maxima right along this line, the uh, natural frequency. So that's a, a very nice result here. Then let's go back and finish by finding what this uh, magnification ratio is for displacement. So putting in the, the natural frequency for the resonant frequency, because they're identical now, uh, the ratio simplifies to 1 over g. And this is the magnification uh, factor, the dynamic magnification for a linear structurally damped system. And then when you compare that with the viscous case, you see that if the viscous damping ratio is small, and when you're at the natural frequency, you recover again this g equals 2 zeta relation. So that does confirm what we had found earlier at resonance. Remember now, always remember at resonance. But this helps you compare the two coefficients. Well, that ends our lecture on the uh, harmonic motion and damping, and I uh, hope you've enjoyed it.